Wow, good morning. Pastor Jesse, thank you for your prayer for the Gleanings team. We are, my wife and I are among the couples that are, get the week off, so we are excited. Um, uh, it is a joy to be here today uh, back at our uh, Redwood City campus. Uh, for folks that may not know me, uh, I am the pastor of our San Jose campus, and it, it really is always just an incredible privilege and joy to be able to return to see friends and faces and catch up with people that are very near and dear to our family's heart. And we have a, we're going to have fun today. Uh, today we are in the second to last week of a message series that we've called Back to Basics. It's looking at the core essentials of the Christian faith as expressed by the Apostles' Creed. And today we're actually talking about church. So you're in the right place. And as we, like before we get into the message itself, uh, it, it did actually make me reflect on just how grateful I am uh, for this particular church, and especially for all of you here in Redwood City. Uh, the work that we are doing as New Beginnings in San Jose was really born out of this community, born out of the faithfulness of this community, the way that God allowed this community to thrive. And we continue to be inextricably linked the work that God allows us to do in San Jose, in that very unique space in downtown, how we get to express his heart, uh, the way that we were really in many ways just sent and we're, we'll conti we continue to minister based on the foundation of this church community right here uh, is, is just remarkable. And I wanted to thank each and every one of you and actually give each and every one of you a special invitation. Uh, this coming Sunday, seven days from today, so next Sunday, um, we are celebrating two years of ministry in San Jose. And yeah, let's celebrate that. And all of you are invited to the celebration. That afternoon after our 11 o'clock gathering in San Jose, uh, we are just having a fun day together in celebration as a community. It's at one o'clock at a place called Grant Elementary School, which is uh, close to downtown San Jose. And we're gonna have a shave ice truck. Uh, if for folks that are a little bit more sporty, we're gonna have some field games. For folks that are not as sporty, we'll have board games and just you know snacks and other special treats uh, to just enjoy each other, celebrate together and all of you are invited. If you have always wondered what our San Jose campus is like and you'd like to come down and visit for our 11 o'clock worship gathering, we'd love to have you. You can grab uh, lunch from somewhere right in downtown and then join us at one. You definitely have time. If you are here next Sunday and worshiping, you have time to make it down and join the celebration. And if you're free, we would love, love, love to have you. All right? Make sense? All right. So, Let's get into the message. Um, I mean, let, let, let me take a, a moment to pray for us as we get into the message. Father God, just so deeply grateful for you and your presence here. I pray that you would just be speaking to each one of us. Uh, God, that we would just be able to open our hearts to you and to be real with you and to be able to receive from you what you want to say to each one of us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So, We've been taking a look at different parts of the Apostles' Creed, and today the brief section that we're looking at is the one in which it says, I believe in the Holy Catholic Church. Now, just to be clear, it's not talking about the Roman Catholic Church. When the Apostles' Creed was written, there was no Roman Catholic Church or Orthodox Church or Protestant Church. There were just churches that were spread out all over the Greco-Roman Empire. And this expression in the Apostles' Creed is basically an expression that there is one big church with a capital C that is composed of all Christians, all those who are following Jesus everywhere in the world. And the, this section of the Apostles' Creed is basically saying, you know, this worldwide church and the local expression of the church that we get to experience is important. It's worth believing in. Now, the challenge for today is that for many, many people, many people who consider themselves religious, many 
who consider themselves Christians or Jesus followers, many folks have, to a significant extent, stopped believing in the church. It may come out as, I'm spiritual, or I'm a Jesus follower, but I don't believe in organized religion. That may be one way of expressing, I really don't believe in the church anymore. It may come out as, I like Jesus, or even I love Jesus, but frankly, I don't trust the church any farther than I can throw it. And when people express this, there's often good reason. The church, many people have been wounded by the church. People have been abused by the church. In other cases, many of us are just disillusioned by church politics or folks in church just not behaving the way that we would hope or expect them to. And I get this feeling. There was a season in my life about 10 years ago where I really came to a place where I felt like I really don't believe in the church anymore. And I was a pastor at the time. Made it a little complicated. I was serving at a church that had just recently, over the, a span of about three years, had two lead pastors resign from moral failings. After that, there was really significant disagreement about what path forward the church should take. Because of all the turmoil, I had been asked to lead a major staff reduction, which was a financial necessity. But after that had happened, I was worn out, burnt out, ready to throw in the towel. And I remember feeling like, you know, I became a pastor to be alongside people at the most significant moments of their lives. I remember telling God several times in that season, I did not become a pastor to be in the middle of drama, dysfunction, and institutional pain. And I remember coming to a point where it was clear that it was my time to move on from that particular church and serving there, but I was really ready to move on from church as a whole. I remember praying about that, that God, I might be done. I remember telling God, would you let me be done? Bargaining with him a little bit. You know, God, you shaped my life in such a way that a part of my story is I graduated with an engineering degree from Stanford. Surely there's something else that you could call me to here in Silicon Valley. And yet, after several months of wrestling, I decided that I still believed in the power and potential of the church. And that if I had the privilege of choosing how to invest the best part of my vocational life, I still believed that the church mattered more than any other human institution that I could contribute to. And that's a huge part of why I'm here today. So today, as I share, I want to answer the question, not just why I believe in the church, but I also want to answer it personally. Why do I still believe in the church? And I certainly don't think that everyone is called to vocational ministry, because we're not. But I do believe, and the Bible is clear, that every Jesus follower has an indispensable role to play in the life of the church. And so if you've ever been hurt by a church or for whatever reason, you've come to a place where you recognize you're holding the church at arm's length, that you're hesitating to bring your best to the church, to trust a church enough to love it, to use your gifts to serve in a church community with passion and creativity. I just want to say that I hope this message is helpful for you today. That's really my prayer. So let's begin by turning our attention to Scripture. And the passage that I want to start with is really one of my favorite passages. It really is the definitive passage for what the church looks like when it's at its best. It comes from Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. Uh, I invite you to stand as we honor the reading of God's word, and I'll go ahead and read it for us. So from Acts 2, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. 
They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. The Lord bless his word. You may be seated. So this is the account of the church at the beginning of Acts. It's a beautiful expression of what the church was intended to be. A community where everyone is seen and cared for, where everyone matters, where people are growing in their relationship with God, where God is changing and transforming lives, and the church is making an impact in the world. And the two words that really jump out, of me, out, jump out at me as we read are glad and sincere glad and sincere. No one is doing anything because they feel like they have to. No one feels obligated to go to church, to sing, and to worship, to care for others. They do these things because it's their joy. They had glad and sincere hearts as they formed a community. Now, as beautiful as this picture of the early church is in Acts, it doesn't tell the full story of the early church. And I actually think that that's a good thing because if the only reference point that we have for church is what we just read in Acts 2, then as we engage with the struggles and challenges of church in our day, we probably would feel disillusioned. So I want to start today by broadening our view of the early church. I think the Bible actually does a great job giving us a way to think about both the beauty and the brokenness of the church, the beauty and the brokenness of the church. And as we take a look at this broader story, one of the things that we'll see is that many of the challenges that we face today wouldn't have been foreign to the early church. And that's actually the first major point, that the things the early church struggled with are really the same types of things that the church today struggles with. And in order to see that, we just need to keep reading through Acts. Uh, at the, in the passage that we read in Acts 2, the very beginning of the early church, the church is entirely Jewish. It's centered in Jerusalem. It has a very Hebraic culture. That's a Hebrew-based culture. And as the church began to grow, new people began to be added to the church. So first, there were Grecian Jews that started becoming a part of the church. These were Jewish people that came from other parts of the Roman Empire, and they were heavily influenced by Greek culture. And what happened was when you had Hebrew culture and Greek culture, even though everyone was Jewish, there started to be disagreements in the church. People started to feel like, hey, we're not being treated fairly. Not everyone is being treated equally. And that we have, an, uh, we have that recorded and shared with us in Acts chapter 6. And then in Acts chapter 10, there was a God-fearing Gentile. So a God-fearing Gentile was someone who was not Jewish, a Gentile, but someone who honored and respected Jewish law and did a lot of things that were written in Jewish law. So this guy named Cornelius in Acts chapter 10 decides to become a Jesus follower as well. And that leads to another huge controversy about, is this okay? Are we cool with this? Is this okay with God, and how do we deal with this as a church? And then in Acts 13, for the first time, total pagans in Antioch decide that they want to follow Jesus too. So these are folks that have no relationship with Judaism at all. And rather than this causing universal celebration, it actually leads to a huge controversy, and they call a major council meeting because they have to decide what are we going to do about this. Because to this point, it wasn't entirely clear that Christianity was even its own thing. At this point in church history, really, most people felt like if you're going to be Christian, you start off as Jewish. Really, Christianity to this point was really a branch of Judaism that considered Jesus the Jewish Messiah. And so many leaders in the early church who were all Jewish themselves felt like if you wanted to become a Christian, you, need, you first needed to become Jewish. That meant following all of the Jewish law, including circumcision, which was a problem for some people. 
especially Gentiles, especially grown Gentile men. You get what I'm saying. So here's what I want to get across. It's a historical fact, but not often addressed directly in a lot of sermons. When we read the New Testament, the underlying context for much of the New Testament is a knockdown, drag out fight between two different cultural groups that traditionally did not get along, looked down on each other, and had a lot of hostility towards each other Jews and Gentiles. And because the early church, to its total shock, now had Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians, much of the New Testament is written just to address the challenge of getting along together, to figure out what it meant to be a church for everyone who wanted to follow Jesus. Now, one thing that I want to note here, one of the things that we learn from this history is that God's grace was always bigger than what those in the church expected. The early church was continually being surprised at who God was bringing into the early church, and then they had to figure out what does it mean for us to do church together, to be the church together. Let me give you an example of actually one of the ways that this affects how we engage with Scripture. 1 Corinthians 13. Even if you are not a regular churchgoer, you probably are familiar with some parts of 1 Corinthians 13. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13.4 is one of the most famous passages um, in the New Testament. It reads, love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. 1 Corinthians 13 it is a, an entire chapter about love. Now, when we hear 1 Corinthians 13, where do we usually hear it? A At a wedding, yes. When Paul wrote 1 Corinthians 13, he was not thinking about marriage. As much as marriages desperately need 1 Corinthians 13. But he did not write 1 Corinthians 13 so that we had something beautiful to read at weddings. He wrote it because he was thinking about the diversity of the church. He was thinking about Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians and Gentile Christians representing the full diversity of the Roman Empire from all different parts. And how do we get along and be the church together? And he said, we got to learn how to love each other with this kind of patient, persevering love. This challenge, the challenge of diversity, was the primary challenge for the early church. And then you added on all the other challenges that came from humans being human. Ambition and greed and sexual impropriety. All of these things were found in the early church because the early church was made up of people. Just like the church today is made up of people. So how did the early church continually overcome these challenges? And this is so important to us because the defining issue for the church in our day is not Jewish culture and Gentile culture, but it's other divides that are just as significant and stark. It's political, Democrats and Republicans. It's rich and poor. It's theological differences and educational differences and cultural differences. These divides are every bit as great as Jews and Gentiles in the early church. And is it possible for a church not just to survive, but to thrive as Jesus intended. What is the hope of the church? And this is what we learn from Scripture. This is the second point. The only hope for the church is to be Jesus first and to let Jesus keep making all things new. Amen. Amen. So remember that beautiful picture of the church that we read in Acts 2? The Apostle Paul also writes about the church. And when he writes about the church, it sounds a little bit different, not because he's contradicting anything in Acts 2, but because he's writing to solve problems. And so he's writing to explain, this is how church is designed to work. And so, for example, this is what he writes in Ephesians 2 to both the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians. Okay? He writes, for, and this is talking about Jesus. For he himself, Jesus is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, 
by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. So notice the context first. Once you know, recognize it, you'll actually start seeing it all through the New Testament. Paul's writing about church, but he's writing to address the challenges the church is facing and especially what it means to hold together when there are Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians struggling to get along. And this is what Paul says. Jesus is our peace. Jesus gave his life on the cross for those who are Jewish. Jesus gave his life on the cross for those who are Gentiles. And because we are both exactly the same in our need for God's grace and mercy and salvation, and it comes to us the exact same way, then for all of us, for you, for me, for the entire church, Jesus must be first. And Jesus is literally doing something new. He's creating one new humanity, the church, as his body, his hands, his feet, his heart of love and grace on this earth. That's his expression of unity and continued ministry on this earth, where previously all you had was different groups of hostility. And then I love this. Then Paul describes all the core metaphors for the church. I mean, honestly, we got a lot of students here. If Paul had turned this in as an English essay, he probably would have gotten a poor grade because it's too many metaphors all together. But Paul has a purpose for every single one. He says, um, the church is an expression of God's kingdom, and you are all kingdom citizens together. He says, the church is an expression of God's household and family, and you are all brothers and sisters together. And he says the church is an expression of God's temple. And every single one of you is a living stone bonded together to bear the spirit of God in this world, to express it so that the world can recognize it. And each of these metaphors aren't just examples. They're actually an expression of his teaching. They're exactly what the people in the church need to hear. So let me give you one example because we don't have time to go through them all. But for example, in verse 19, Paul is talking about citizenship. You are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people. The reason why he talks about citizenship is because it was such a major deal for both the Jews and the Gentiles. The Jews said, our citizenship is with Israel. That's what gives us identity. That's what makes us proud. The Gentiles, some of them were Roman citizens, and that was a huge deal of status. So all the ones that weren't Roman citizens desperately wanted to be. But the point that Paul is making is if citizenship is going to be your primary source of identity and value and what you're proud of, then of course, if you're Jewish and Gentile in the church, you're never going to get along. But let's talk about citizenship because, because of what Jesus has done because of God's kingdom on earth, and because you are now a part of it, your primary citizenship is not that you are Roman or Israelite or American or what zip code you're from or what college you went to or what company you work for, but the most important citizenship you have is that you are citizens of God's kingdom. And that's what the church is, an expression of God's kingdom on earth. When the church forgets this truth, when we forget that our only hope is 
putting Jesus first and drawing our identity and our value from him. Having our identity flow from Jesus' love and Jesus' character. That our church becomes, then the church becomes like any other human institution. We divide based on demographics and culture and class and politics. And because we divide, our blind spots just get bigger and blinder. When Jesus isn't first, the church can wound people in the worst ways. The church loses its integrity and transparency. It starts to cover things up to hide its own failings instead of repenting and choosing for health. It starts to use the world's tools. It starts to use worldly power to change the world by force instead of using the only healthy tool that Jesus gave us which is sacrificial love to change the world. But there is one difference between the church and all other institutions in the world. And this is one reason why we're called to keep believing in the church even when it is broken and in need of healing. The difference is this. Jesus died for the church. And Jesus rose with redeeming power for the church. And Jesus is always working through the Holy Spirit to call the church back to himself. So that's why even in the darkest chapters of the church throughout history, there have always have been Jesus first Christians in communities, maintaining the integrity of the church and holding the church accountable. And when the church follows Jesus and puts Jesus first, The church is the light that this world desperately needs. It's a reminder for everyone that God's love is for all people across all the differences and divisions in our world. So let me offer this illustration. I like these illustrations. Um, I heard this in a sermon about two decades ago, and it's always stuck with me, so I'm going to share this with you today. Does anyone recognize what this is? Ah, someone knows. It's a rock tumbler. You may have had one as a kid. You may have one still today. It's okay. Um, uh, So this is a rock tumbler. What it does is you put some ordinary rocks like this, and you put them in this chamber. You add some grit you add some water, you turn it on, and this chamber starts to spin. And as it spins over the course of days and weeks, the rocks tumble into each other. They start to bump into each other. The water and the grit create just the right amount of friction. If there's too many rocks and too much grit, then everything is jammed together, nothing can move, nothing changes, the rocks are just in pain. For rocks. <laughs> if there's too little friction, then the rocks really don't interact with each other and they don't change either. But when just the right amount of friction is there and the rocks tumble together and hang in there, then they actually polish each other. And you end up with something remarkable. The ordinary rocks transform into something extraordinary. I don't know if everyone can see these. Maybe a little bit far back for the social hall. But you can kind of see how the rocks transform. There's nothing added to these rocks. They've just tumbled together and polished together over time because of the water and the grit, and they didn't give up. And what happens is the unique parts of the rocks, the colors, the brilliance of the rock are able to shine through because they were interacting and not giving up and hanging in there and tumbling with each other. And that transformation was able to happen. Now, this rock tumbler is what God is doing in the church. We got all kinds of different folks. We got some grit, which are our blind spots, our rough edges, the challenges of this world. We also have water, which is the blood of Jesus that covers us, is constantly at work in our lives. 
And as we tumble together, if we don't give up and if we give it enough time, we actually polish each other. And what God intends in our lives is able to come forth and shine through, and we become brilliant not just individually, but also as a community. Now, here's the thing. As a church, because we're a church, we're going to be kind and gracious to everyone, hopefully. But within the church, we have the capacity for an entirely unique relationship with one another. And this is largely why we're going through the Apostles' Creed, because we're looking at the core essentials of the Christian faith. And the reality is, if I'm embracing these core essentials of what it means to be a Jesus follower, who God is, who Jesus is, how to be saved, and you're embracing the same thing, then no matter what other differences we might have or things that we disagree on, there is far more that we have in common than what separates us. And we don't have to agree on everything in order to be what the Bible says we are. Citizens together, brothers and sisters, living stones bonded together for God's glory here on this earth. That's the expression of what the church is intended to be. And when we are able to do that, we truly are the light of this world because the world desperately needs this kind of love. So we've looked at how the challenges in the early church are not that different from the challenges in the church today and how the early church learned the secret that the only hope for the church, the only hope for the church is to be Jesus first, to allow Jesus to keep making all things new. So let me close with this. I shared at the beginning of this message that it was personal, that I wanted to share not just why to believe in the church, but why I still believe in the church. And what kept me believing about 10 years ago, when I was ready to throw in the towel, was that I had experienced enough of the Acts 2 church reality that I knew the promise and the power of the church was real, even if I wasn't experiencing it at that moment. I knew it because I had experienced it in college, where I found a community that was for students just like me, folks that had grown up, and we had grown up on the assumption that our value and identity in the world was based on how well we achieved, um, what our performance was, how we compared with other people. And I found a community where it was okay to not be okay, to not have everything together. And in that community, I experienced grace that transformed my life. That was church. I experienced it later as a young adult in my 20s in a community with folks from all kinds of different backgrounds. And I experienced it in the remarkable generosity of that community. There was one woman whose grandmother passed away, and she just didn't have enough money to get home to the Philippines for the funeral. So that community came together as young adults and allowed her, like gave her enough money to be able to buy a ticket to go home to the Philippines for that funeral. I saw it in the ways that we covered each other's tuitions when people were short on tuition. I saw it in the way that we lived life together as we grieved and mourned together as three different members of that community died far too young, across 10 years. And I experienced it in the way that in these communities that were Jesus first, it allowed those in the community, people just like me, to make Jesus first decisions, not just for that time, but year after year and now decade after decade, I still see the impact of people's ongoing choices that allow them to lead lives that are doing tremendous good in the world as an expression of their relationship with God. So when Pastor Herman approached me about 10 years ago, and he said, I'd like to start a new church, and no pressure, but I think this is something that God would have us do together, but you have to believe that too. It took some time for me to really think about that. I had to wrestle through the hurt that I was feeling at that moment. But I'm so glad that God brought me to a point where I could say yes. 
And when I told Pastor Herman that I was in, what he said to me was, you know, PT, I'm really happy for me, but I'm really happy for you too, because I think we would both miss out if we weren't a part of what God wants to do. And that's been absolutely true. That was the start of this church, New Beginnings, almost 10 years ago. And we aren't a perfect church. No church is a perfect church. But we try our best to be real and sincere in putting Jesus first. And I experience so much of what the Bible describes in Acts 2 right here in this community. At our church, more so than any other church that I've been a part of, I know how much effort all of us put into our relationships. And I know that sometimes it's hard that sometimes we are that, you know, in that rock tumbler tumbling against each other. But I also see the fruit of that. I see the joy of relationships that cross lines of difference that really don't exist hardly anywhere else in the world. And it's a witness to the difference that God's love can make. I see it in the generosity that we have together for those outside our walls that across nine years we've given away over a million dollars in partnership to nonprofits um, so that incredible work can be done in our community. That together as a community we've invested tens of thousands of serving hours to serve alongside those nonprofits and in other projects that we've done. But I especially think about it when I think of the stories, the family that happened to come into our church parking lot one Sunday because they were on a road trip home and they had a flat tire and our church had the privilege of coming alongside them, providing them with a new tire and making sure that they can make it all the way home. I think of the woman who came into our San Jose campus after one of our gatherings, and she only spoke Chinese, but she was able to communicate that the downtown buses weren't running that day, and she needed to get to the hospital for her second rabies shot. And I think about the community that was just ready to jump in and make sure that she made it to her appointment. And I think of another extraordinary couple in our San Jose community that provided one of our unhoused neighbors that we've been walking alongside with with a brand new stroller because she needed to go onto public, trans public transit and strollers are allowed on public transit, but shopping carts are not. All of these pictures are a part of the beauty of the church for me. So I want to close with just two final encouragements. First, I want to say, if you've been wounded by a past church experience, I want to say that I am so sorry. And I want to let you know that God grieves with you too. And he not only grieves, but I think that God is outraged when the church falls short of what it's called to be, and especially when evil is done in his name instead of good. But if you've been wounded by the church, I want to encourage you to let God heal that wound and to find healing in the context of a church that reflects God's heart. Because I want to say, just like if we had someone in our lives who we thought was a friend and they betrayed our trust, they broke our heart, it may make sense to end that relationship, but it wouldn't make sense to give up on friendship as a whole with everyone and anyone. And I want to say the church is the same way. The second thing I just want to encourage you is if you know that you haven't been bringing your best to church, you haven't truly been growing with others to truly being part of the community, maybe it's because of the pandemic, maybe because sometimes, you know, watching anonymously online is just too convenient. We get it. But I want to invite you to take a step today to love the church the way that Jesus loved the church. And I want to say this especially, that this is for you no matter what age and stage you are. If you are a student or a young adult and you feel young in the church, I want to let you know that your voice and your heart matters. It matters to our entire community. I want to let you know that if you're a senior, that your voice and your heart and the gifts that you bring, they matter in our community. But for all of us, it does require an active choice to lean in, to bring our best. 
And if you know that you've kind of been on the sidelines and God is calling you to engage in a deeper way, I just want to invite you to let today be that day where you make that change. Jesus died for the church. He rose again for the church. He transforms the world through the church. And ultimately, what Pastor Herman said to me 10 years ago is true for all of us. If we don't take our part in what God calls us to do as his body, we miss out on something that matters for eternity. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for this time where we've opened our hearts so that you can speak to us. And I pray that if you've called us to take a next step, and especially to reflect on our emotions toward church and church community, and all the ways that that might have been strained or broken in the past, but that you want to come near and heal, I pray that we would let you do that and that you would allow us to be wrapped into the vibrancy of being a part of a community of brothers and sisters, of those on mission together, committed to expressing your heart of love to this world. Pray that you would help each one of us to find our place in that. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Pastor Jesse.